song tonight. So let's worship this morning. Let's pray first. Father, we thank you. God, we thank you for today. God, we thank you for allowing us the opportunity to be able to come outside and to worship you. God, we thank you for the beautiful weather that you provided for us today. God, we thank you for the breeze. God, I thank you for your word that's going to go forth. God, I pray that you will open our hearts and our ears so that we may hear, Father, that we may hear you differently than we ever have, God, that we will not leave this service today the same way that we came. God, bless us, God. We want to hear from you. We want to receive from you. Father, we want to experience you like we've never had before. Let your presence just be thick and thick here this morning, God, as we worship, as we lift up this offering to you this morning, that you be glorified and pleased. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. Come on, let's worship him today. Come on, right where you are, just put your hands together in your car. I was buried beneath my shame And who could carry that kind of weight It was my doom Till I met you Come on, say I was breathing I was breathing but not Alive and all my failures, and all my failures, I've tried to hide. It was my dream till I met you. Come on, shout it out this morning. You called my name, and I ran out of that name. Praise this morning. 
testimony because of the blood of Jesus and we are excited that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Do you believe that this morning? Oh, I'm not so safe and fall like lightning and I saw darkness run for cover but the miracle that I just can't get over my name So say thank you, God, for protecting us, Lord Jesus, for keeping us safe, God, for, for even us to be able to join here together. God, we thank you for that today, Lord. And we just, just want to take a moment and just worship you, Jesus. Give your name the highest praise. 
thank you, Lord. You know, as we prepare for communion this morning, I can't help but think about the song that we just sang, our testimony. And, I, and, and scripture tells us in Revelation that we overcome the evil one by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And it's because of the shed blood of Jesus. It's because of the gift that God gave us, his only begotten son, that any of us, any of us that, has, that are here this morning, it's the, he's the reason why any of us have a testimony. And so this morning, as we come to the table, I, I just want us to just take a few seconds and just remember where God has brought you from. You know, I think we forget that sometimes. We, we get saved, we begin to live our lives, and things are going well for us. We have a job, we're making the money that we want to make, and we forget that we have a testimony. We forget that God brought us from somewhere. We forget that we were not always the person that we were. We forget that we were once in darkness, now able to see in light because of Jesus. We forget that sometimes. So this morning, I just encourage you just to remember. Remember that old sinful self of yours, of yourself. Just remember and then take a moment and remember the marvelous light that Jesus brought each and every one of us into. And in that same remembrance, we, that we should be even more eager to share this table with people who don't know, know him. We should be even more eager to share the love of Christ. We should be even more eager to be able to give the joy that Jesus has given, given each and every one of us because of where we've been and because of where he has brought us. And it's nothing but by his grace that we are saved. Because I don't know about you, I should be dead. I should be lost, go out of my mind. I probably should be in jail somewhere. But because of the grace of mercy of God, he kept me to be able to have a testimony that I may stand and I may say, I once was, but I am now because of the gift of Jesus. Amen. So as we take the cup today, we take the cup that symbolizes his blood that was spilled out for us. Scripture tells us without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so this morning, we take this cup that represents and symbolizes your blood that was spilled for each and every one of us. God, we don't take it for granted. We don't take it for lightly, for, for, take it lightly. But God, I just ask that we would just lay our, our stuff down at your feet and we would just once again rekindle the love that we have for you. God, it wouldn't be about politics. It wouldn't be about money. It wouldn't be about who's better than the other, God, but it would simply be because I love Jesus. And so, Father, I ask that your blood come and cleanse us, not just our, our bodies, but our minds and our thoughts, our habits, our walk, the way we think, the way we talk. God, we thank you for this cleanse, the cleansing power of your blood we take in remembrance of you this morning. And Father, we take this bread that symbolizes your body that was broken for us, that was bruised for us. God, we, we don't... We don't take it for granted. We don't take it lightly. And God, I just ask, God, as we remember the price that you paid, as we remember the grace that you've extended, the mercy that you extended, Father, God, that we will be, we will be quicker to extend it to others, Father. We will be quicker to extend your mercy, love, and grace. In Jesus' name, take and eat this morning. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. God, we thank you that it's new every morning. And we worship you today, Jesus. Thank you. Oh, we thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's sing together. People come together. People come together. Strangers' names, our blood is one. Children of generations, of every nation, of kingdom come. So don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high, don't fear no evil fix your eyes on this one truth God is madly in love with you so take courage, hold on be strong remember where our help comes from oh, 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 oh.
let your heart, so don't let your heart be in trouble. Hold your head up high, don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes, come on. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where hell comes from. Saturdays we went through the neighborhoods praying over the neighborhoods and um, I, I really believe God may have spoken to us about where we might have a building uh, in the future because as you know the schools are closed uh, I wanted to mention uh, as an announcement that we're going to start meeting on the 20th of September back in church uh, of this church building but you have to register in advance. Instead of doing it at 10 o'clock, we'll be doing it at 9.30 to 10.30, and then we'll have it on 12 o'clock online. We'll do that three weeks out of the month, uh, and then we'll do one one week, of, uh, one Sunday a month, we'll do in the big, uh, like this, out, out here, uh, the drive-in cars, because um, we can get more people. But between the two places, uh, the two sides, we should be able to have a side just for the kids with their parents, 
and then the other side for the adults. And then if that overflows, then we might start a, 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 maybe a Saturday night service. So just saying, just put that on your calendar uh, three weeks from today on the 20th of September. We're going to be inside. And, um, and so uh, we'll, we'll be given lots of uh, information on that. Uh, as you know, the schools are still closed, so we're going to do what we can while we can. But I want to thank you for your patience. I also want to say I feel like we're kind of like Jesus a little bit. He said he had nowhere to lay his head, so we're glad about that too. Hey, we had a lot of interesting things happen over this week. Um, we went to Creekside Community. You should be able to see some of the videos and some of the pictures online uh, on our Facebook page. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9 that God is more than ready to overwhelm you with every form of grace so that you will have more than enough of everything, every moment and in every way. He will make you overflow with abundance in every good thing you do, just as the scripture says about the one we trust in. Because we've sown extravagantly and given to the poor, his kindness and generous deeds will never be forgotten. This generous God supplies abundant seed to the farmer, which becomes bread for our meals and is even more extravagant towards you. First, he supplies every need plus more. Then he multiplies the seed as you sow it so that the harvest of your generosity will grow. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 8 to 10. The truth is when we give to God, we're not just giving away money. We are sowing our heart, our blood, our tears, our sweat into God's kingdom. And it makes a difference. We were able to do a great outreach. Um, we were praying for, we had our prayer team. Uh, Isabella was part of it. We have uh, some people come from all over to help us pray for people. Prayed for several policemen. Prayed for a policeman with a bad back. God touched him instantly. He said the pain went away. So isn't that an awesome thing? Amen. <laughs> and uh, if you didn't notice, in Facebook, I challenge you to go back. I have a little video that was sent to us from my twin brother in Africa, Pastor Steve Mayanja. They have built the first two buildings of the Bible College that we sent the we sent about a year ago, about thirty thousand dollars. That was the first ten percent to help them start the Bible College, and so. We, you can actually see the buildings and kind of see where they're going for the future. I also want to mention, I want to thank you guys. We did a great job. You did a great job. And I wanted to mention the one thing that really touched my heart when I watched the videos. They don't have water there. They have to dig really deep to get it. And so I said, why can't our church supply the money for that well? It's about $12,000. We already have the first thousand. Uh, if God touches your heart, just put a special for the well. Uh, because we want them to have well for their students. Um, I've been there before in Africa where we didn't have water and we had to drink from the dirty creek down the road. We don't want them to do that. Amen. Well, let me pray over you. Let me pray a blessing for your, your faithfulness and tithing that God would send that blessing back to you. Father, I thank you, Father, that even as so many people have sown electronically and in and, and their ties, their sweat, blood, and tears, oh God, I ask that you bless back to them. Bless their families. Bless their children, O oh God. Take sickness from their midst. Let no plague come near their dwelling, O oh God. Bless them with work and good work, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. We're so glad you're here today. I'm going to get right into my message so my sidekick can stop playing over here. Um, how many of you got a puzzle piece today? How many of you thought that was a mistake? <laughs> it was not a mistake. Because I want, you, I want to ask you a question. By looking at that piece of puzzle, can you tell what the whole picture is? <laughs> no, you can't. You can't tell the whole picture by looking at your piece. You cannot, okay? And see, that's how we look as the body of Christ. By ourselves, we don't make much sense. But when we find our place together, we make something beautiful in life. And so today, we're starting a series, a new series on how to find your destiny and your purpose in life. You say, Pastor, I'm real old. Listen, Moses started his destiny when he was 80. 80. Hello? 80. That's right. And so I'm just saying you're never too old. And we're going to talk today about why God hides his destiny from us, okay? Part of your destiny and purpose is finding how and where you fit both in the body of Christ that Jesus called his church, but also where you fit in life. So we're going to start at the very beginning. We're going to talk about the mystery of purpose. You know, the Bible talks about mysteries 29 times. In Mark chapter 4, verse 11, Jesus said, To you have been given the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Romans eleven twenty-five. 25, For
For I don't want you, brethren, to be uninformed of the mystery. Ephesians 1, 9, I love this. For he has made known to us the mystery of his will. There is a mystery about his will for your life. Do you know that most Christians never figure out what the mystery of God's will is for their life? So that's why we're going to begin looking at it today. I believe it's so important. And let me just say this. Um, we, we have had a heck of a year, have we not? How many of you know that this year did not go the way we expected it to go? But I am telling you, that's kind of how life is. Life throws all kinds of things your way. And we get so distracted that many times we find ourselves in a place we never thought we would be. That's why it's so important to know your destiny of God for your life. Uh, if you have your, your bulletin, you open it up. The answer to number one is it says God has hidden your destiny from you. But he wants to reveal it to you at the right time. But when we start out in life, our, life, our, des our destiny is hidden from us. One of the, the number one question people ask me as a pastor is, Pastor, what am I called to do? Why am I on this planet? My job as pastor is to help you discover and find your destiny, to help prepare you to move into your destiny, to help you find out what God has designed you for and help you get into it. You know, I see so many people, their lives are crashing around them, and it's because they tried to get into the wrong place or they tried to promote themselves at the wrong time before they were ready for their destiny. You see, God will not send you someplace that you're not ready to occupy. I'm going to say that again. God will not send you into your destiny if you're not ready for it. Deuteronomy 7.22, when God was talking to uh, the children of Israel, right before they entered the promised land, God told them this. He said, I will not drive out the nation. I will drive the nations out before you little by little. You'll not be allowed to eliminate them all at once or else wild animals will multiply around you. See, God told his children that he would only drive out the, the nations according to their capacity to occupy what God has given them. What does that mean for us? Well, that's a great question. That means, and this is the answer to number two, it means that God has a process that he uses in our lives before we actually enter our life's destiny. The first text we're going to look at is 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to look at three different texts today. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, it talks about destiny purpose. I want to I want to look at a few things in this one first. Paul's writing a letter to the Corinthian church. If you know anything else about the Bible, the Corinthian church was the <laughs> had the most problems of any church that Paul started, okay? They they were young, they made a lot of mistakes. He was trying to correct and mentor them. In 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1, Paul says just right out. He said, "And I, brethren, I could not speak to you as to spiritual people." How many of you think that would be an insult if your pastor said, hey, buddy, you're not spiritual? But isn't he writing to Christians? Yes, he is. And he's telling them that although they're Christians, he can't speak to them in spiritual terms. Notice he goes on. But as carnal, as to be babies in Christ. That's my, the big wasn't there. But as to babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food because for until now you were not able to receive it. Even now you're not able See, when people are babies, how many of you have ever had a baby? Honk your horn if you had a baby. There we go. Okay. How many of you know that they are not concerned about you and you getting your sleep at night? They're concerned about them getting their milk. Am I right? <laughs> when babies are hungry, they scream for food. How many of you have seen a toddler throw a temper tantrum? Yes, they do. Why do they do it? Because you're not giving them, you're not letting them do something they want to do or eat. Now, spiritual babies are great at throwing temper tantrums, too, but we don't call it that. We call it offense. Oh, I'm offended, Pastor. Well, that's a spiritual temper tantrum. Let me go on with the Apostle Paul. Verse 3. He said, you're still worldly, for since there's jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you? How do people in our world act? They promote themselves. We live in a selfie culture, am I right? Where self-promotion is a way of life. So that's the answer to number three. Self-promotion is a symptom of a baby Christian, but it doesn't work in God's kingdom. God's not impressed by us trying to promote ourselves. And so Paul was saying that you're jealous, you're quarreling, you're jostling for position. Reminded me when we first went to the Soviet Union in the Russian mentality, if you wanted to be anybody in Christ, you had to be on stage. I'll never forget when we first started, we had a stage, we had about 200 people in our church, our first couple of weeks and um, a absolutely almost everybody wanted to be on the stage and uh, I said hey hey we, 
We can't have 200 people on stage. We actually, you guys can actually just sit down there. You're just as important as someone on the stage. And there, there is a jockeying in our life trying to show everybody who we are. But Paul is trying to see, show the Corinthian church their motives are wrong. Verse 4 he said, for you people say, I follow Paul. Another say, I, I follow Apollos. Are you not acting like mere humans? What after all is Apollos? What after is Paul? Only servants through whom you believed. And here is the big phrase. As the Lord has assigned to each his task. I, I want you to catch this, this phrase. It's so important. God has assigned to everyone their task. I'm going to say it again. God has assigned to you a task. And that's the answer to number four. You have a task assigned you from the Lord in life. And if you don't do it, no one else will do it. Why? Because it is your task. How many of you remember before coronavirus and you went to the mall? How many of you remember that? There we go. Yeah. So when you go to the mall or go to the beach, you're walking down the street, most people try to blend in and look like everyone else. Am I right? I remember in school, everyone tried to look like the cool people. I don't even know if they use the word cool anymore, but the cool people. They wore a certain shirt. They wore a certain type of jeans. Uh, I know taste has changed since I've been in school because apparently when we went to school, if we had holes in our jeans, that was like a... The, the worst thing on the planet, but apparently those are more expensive now. Am I right? But, but I want you to catch something. We try to blend in in life, but that's not how God designed you. God designed you to be unique. You can try to be like everyone else, but the truth is God made you distinctive. He made you unique for a reason. Verse 6, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who sows or waters is anything but only God who makes it grow. The one who plants, the one who waters have one purpose and they will be rewarded according to their own labor. I want you to catch that. That's the answer to number five. You will be rewarded from the Lord according to how you handle the task God gave you to do in life. Then Paul goes on to say in verse nine, by the grace God gave me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder. I want you to notice here that God gave him a grace to carry out his assignment in life. Grace is God's power and ability made available to you to help you do your assignment. And Paul is saying that when you find your assignment, you'll also find a grace there to, to live with it. If you're a husband, God gives you a grace to be a husband. If you're a wife, God has given you a grace to be a wife. If you're a plumber, God's given you a grace to be a plumber. Wherever God calls you, this is the answer to number six, there is a grace to carry out the assignment. But here's the issue with us because we are miserable in life because we are carrying out someone else's assignment and we have no grace for it. I'm going to help you find your assignment in this series, but, but you have to find the grace of God in your assignment. Verse 10 to 15, by the grace God gave me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each should build with care for no one can lay any foundation other than that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation, which is Jesus Christ, or using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will get a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer a loss, yet will be saved, even though as one escaping through the flames. I want to talk about that for a minute because Paul is talking to believers. When he talks about the flames here, he's not talking about the flames of hell. He's talking about our reward for what we do in life, and that's really important. See, God tells us that as we do life's purpose, it builds on the foundation that Jesus put in us when we were born again, and we will be rewarded accordingly. Paul tells us that people build with different materials. He mentioned gold, silver, costly stones, and then he mentioned wood, hay, and straw. Let me ask a question. I want you to think on this. What makes gold valuable? What makes silver valuable? And why isn't straw valuable? Value is based on scarcity, am I right? The less there is, the more, the, the more rare it is. How many of you have seen the Washington Monument? How many of you have seen the Washington Monument? Because if you haven't seen it, you're either blind or have never been north of, uh, north of uh, Arlington. When they built it, they put aluminum on top of the, on the capstone is, is covered with aluminum. Do you know why? Because in the 1800s, aluminum was scarce. It was the most valuable, most expensive metal there was. 
And that's why they put that ugly aluminum, which we all have in our homes. We have aluminum foil. We have aluminum cooking pots. Because somewhere after they put that on, they figured out how to make it really easy and really cheap. Values based on scarcity. Let me ask this question. Do you think that living like the rest of the crowd makes you more valuable to God? Or using your scarce and unique gifts in life makes you more valuable? See, when you build on your life and the foundation that Jesus made in your life, and you offer your life to follow your assignment, the one who created you calls you valuable. But if you follow everyone else, you're like hay and straw. You're very common. But if you let God show you and lead you into your uniqueness to God, God is the one who esteems value. And to God, you will be like gold and silver and costly stones. The crowd wants to be like hay and straw. They, want to, they, they care more about how to look like people on TV or on social media. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 9, and this is the second scripture I wanted to look at. He says, don't you know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets a prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Your life is like a race. Many of you are not even on the right track. Hello? Some of you don't even know where the start is, and you surely don't know where the finish is. But the, when we are in a race, your task that God has given you is like a race. And it becomes all that we should be seeing and training for. You know when people run, they actually have to practice starting. They have to practice t tossing the baton. How many of you have seen those relay races where they drop the baton? Oh my gosh, and it's lost there. And then the end, they have to practice ending because they have to l leave a little burst of energy for the end. They practice every bit of it because they know the race can be lost at any point in the race. That's why Paul said in verse 26, I don't run like someone aimlessly. Hear me, and this is the answer to number seven, unless you have a fixed vision of who you are, where you're going, and what God has asked you to do, you will live life aimlessly. This is the problem with our culture. I could never commit suicide knowing that God has given me a task. But we have been told in life that we are just protoplasmic slime that evolved, that we have no maker, that we have no reason, and we have no purpose, and that's why our culture is lost. But unless you have a fixed vision of, where, of who you are, you will live life aimlessly. Do not let culture dictate what your priority in life is instead of God. So today we're going to talk about the track you're running. Paul says that everyone, God has assigned a t task. And with that task, you have a track, okay? So if you don't know what those are, you're going to be distracted in life. Most people, they just try to survive to payday. That is not your race. That is not your track. But if you don't know what God has called you for, why you're here on this planet, you will be easily distracted in life. So we're going to help you find your track. We're going to help you see the goal that God has set before you and to show you your uniqueness in the master's hand. So let's go back uh, today to our theme. Our assignment is a mystery to us. When you're born again, we do not understand the mystery of our purpose yet. It's, it's a mystery. So let me ask this question. Why would God hide his assignment from me? Why would God hide his assignment from you? Well, think about Jesus. When he was born, Satan tried to kill. He didn't know which one was the Messiah, but he knew there was a baby in that village that was going to change things, and he tried to kill them all. And, and here's the wisdom from God. This is the answer to number eight. Not only is your race hidden from you, it's also hidden from the enemy who wants to keep you from ever starting the race. So here's the one thing you need to know. Answer to number nine. It's in God's favor, and it's in your best interest not to reveal his plans to you completely until you're mature enough and tested enough. That word tested is an important one to reach your destiny. Because your destiny is not a goal. It is a place of occupation. It is a place in life that you put the flag down and say, I claim this for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a place where you are the light of the world. It's a place where you are the salt of the earth, and you make people around you thirsty for God. Amen. Your destiny is not a place to finish. It's a place to occupy. Come on, that's good preaching. Anyway. <laughs> See, God wants his kingdom and his government to re be represented in every area of light. Uh, the answer to number 10 is the misconception that the church has had for many years is that all that God ever does on the planet takes place in a church building. That's not true. 
If you're a real estate agent, God gives you a passion for real estate, and, and that's your territory. If you're an engineer, God, God claims, gives you a claim to that territory. If you're in government, God gives you a place to claim as your territory. Amen. You know, it used to be thought that only, God only called preachers and pastors. That's not true. God doesn't call many into the five-fold ministry, apostles, apostles, and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. No, no. What God does do is call a few into the ministry to raise up you to occupy your spaces in our culture. And there are seven areas of dominion in media. How many of you know that we need more Christians in media? Yes, we do. What a difference it would be if the people running uh, our news agencies were Christians and born again. What perspective they would have. You know, I used to watch uh, Paul Harvey, listen to Paul Harvey on the radio, the rest of the news. And you know what? You had a good feeling no matter how bad the world was. You always, always after listening to Paul Harvey and the rest of the news, you always felt good about life. Government, that's another area of dominion, education. What would happen if the people teaching our kids and teaching in colleges and universities had a Christian perspective? How different? Yeah, and I know I see someone, I see Kimberly, yeah. I see, I see people that are teaching already. We've got lots of teachers here. Praise God, we need you teaching them. Education, economy, arts, and family. Wouldn't it be amazing if Bill Gates was born again? If, if the owner of Google, if Elon Musk, if all those people that are uh, the, the people that started Facebook, if they were born again, what an impact they would have on this planet. So the job of the church is to help you discover your place of dominion to occupy. That's number 11. So how do we find the track that God wants you to run on? Well, you know, God gives you throughout life glimpses, visions, dreams like he did to, to Joseph that God wants you to run on, so to speak. He gives you a passion. He gives you problems that you feel like you have to solve, answers that you see that no one else sees. Those are clues for God's future for your life. But I want to finish with one parable that's the most powerful parable that tells you why you do not still know your destiny if you don't know where your place of occupation is. Turn to Luke chapter 16, verse 1. Jesus told his disciple, his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. I, I, you got to hear this. Lord, I ask that you open our ears to hear this. There was a rich man whose manager, now this is this, is, this rich man who was the manager, the rich man is, is referring to God, and the manager is often referring to us. But this manager was accused of wasting his possessions, the rich man's possessions. So the rich man called him in and he asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manage, manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What can I do now? My master is, away from, is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do. When I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each of the master's debtors, and he said the, to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, I owe him 900 gallons of olive oil. He said, Take your bills quickly. Write down 450. He asked the second, How much do you owe? 1,000 bushels a week. He said, Quickly, take your bill and write down 800. When the master saw what the manager did, the dishonest manager, he commended him because he said he had acted shrewdly. I think we have read this parable many times but have never understood it. God is not commending the man for being dishonest. He was commanding him for being shrewd. And here's what the master was saying to the man. He says, oh, I, can't, I can see that you can be shrewd when you want to be shrewd. But you weren't shrewd with my stuff. You weren't shrewd, shrewd with my trust that I gave you for my profit. When you, and, but when you were going to lose your job, all of a sudden you could find out how to take care of yourself. But you didn't take care of my stuff. You didn't operate in that same shrewdness. Do you know what God's saying in this parable? What would happen if we had the same, same shrewdness towards God's kingdom as we do for our life. See, in our culture, life is all about survival. Am I right? It's about me surviving. This guy was true to our culture. He made sure that it would be good for him after he was fired. But he failed the test in God's eyes, not because he wasn't a nice guy, but because he did not handle the trust that God had given him with shrewdness. He wasn't working to see how he could help his master profit. How does that apply to me? Well, I'm going to tell you because this determines whether you're going to get to that next step in life. When you go to work, do you work for you or do you work for God? I've had Christians tell me, well, they're only paying me 10 bucks an hour and that's all I'm going to work. And eh, you failed. Here's the change of heart that has to take place. It's a heart check. 
See, this parable tells us why many Christians never reach their potential, never reach their destiny. They fail this test and God cannot trust them with their destiny. God tries to train us, but we refuse to be trained. If your heart is for God's kingdom, then you can be trusted with much because your heart isn't moved by other stuff. But this guy was only shrewd with his own stuff. Verses 10 to 12, Jesus summarized it like this. Whoever can be trusted with little can be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with little will be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy, that's the word. If you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches? If you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? So let me ask this question. Where is the proving ground where God proves you for your destiny? People say, oh, pastor, it's in the anointing. I'm anointed. No, no, that's not it. Pastor, it's the vision I had. No. Pastor, I saw an angel. So what? The proving ground. And this is the answer to number 12. The place where God tests you to see if you're ready for your destiny is in your trustworthiness over the affairs of life. It starts when you're a kid at your parents' home, when your parents raise you to be trustworthy. Parents, if we don't teach our children to be accountable, to be trustworthy in their life, we're short-circuiting them from their destiny. We have to teach our children to become people of their word, that they do what they say they would do. I know people that are grown that do not do what they say they would do. Why would God open their destiny to them? If your kids aren't responsible for doing their chores, they will not be responsible down the road. How many of you have ever gone to a fast food restaurant 10 minutes before it closes? It looks like it's already closed. All the chairs are up on the tables, and no one wants to wait on you. I've had people fight, say, oh, I'm not waiting on him. I'm not waiting on him. I, I've got to clean dishes. I've got to do this. I've got to do my whatever. I guarantee you none of those people own the restaurant. Hello? <laughs> Am I right? Because if the owner would, had been there, he would say, come on in. I went to a restaurant 20 minutes with my wife. Before it closes, oh, we've already turned off the oven. So if you want something cold, you can eat, but not, not. And so, I, but so what I want, there's an attitude there. If the owner had been there, the oven would have been on because he's concerned about how to pay everyone, uh, pay, to pay all his bills and all the salaries. Hear me, God is the one who promotes us in life and God knows if you can be trusted with your destiny by how you work right now where you are. And nothing's hidden from God, not your cheating heart that cheats your employer by the way you worked. Hello? This is one of the most important principles that we can learn in life. David was on a hillside watching sheep. And do you know what? When he was a teenager watching sheep, he never thought he would be a king. But he did have a heart to protect the sheep, these small sheep. And he risked his life to save those sheep because... That in the end, these sheep would get old and they would be eaten by somebody. Am I right? Why would David risk his life for those sheep that no one cared about? Because he had been given a trust to watch those sheep and he did it with all his heart. When it came time to find a new king, David was not chosen because he killed Goliath. Because he'd been anointed long before he ever saw Goliath. Why did God choose David to be king? God said that David was a man after his heart. What does that mean? He proved himself to be loyal and faithful to the trust given him. You may not realize this, but God is faithful and loyal. He has promised us that he would never leave us nor forsake us. He is always with us day and night. He listens to every prayer. I am challenging you to rise to that same level. You know, God knows where you are. God knows where you are. David proved himself to be loyal and faithful to the trust given him. He didn't consider it to be a dead-end job in the middle of nowhere. God knows where you are today. That's why you don't need to be a self-promoter, because that doesn't work with God. God found David on a hillside when no one else knew about him. Joseph was a slave in a prison for almost 20 years. But he was faithful to the trust given him. Even as a slave, he worked with excellence, refusing to commit adultery with his master's wife. He found himself in prison unjustly, yet he worked in prison so diligently they put him in charge of prison. Why? I mean, am I right? If you're a slave and then you're thrown in prison, how many of you know you're going to spit in the food and be nasty? But he took every assignment and he did it to the best, and that's why he became second in command of Pharaoh. He showed himself worthy to handle the trust given him in two dead-end jobs, slavery and prison. 
and God promoted him because God knew that Joseph would be faithful at second in command because he was faithful and loyal as a slave and a prisoner. Answer to number 13, see I'm almost done. The message we need to tell ourselves and our kids is that no matter how low paying your job is, do it with all your strength, do it with excellence, do it as if you were working to God, for God himself. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 5, talking to slaves but same as it's really referring to employees now. Employees obey your earthly bosses with respect and fear. Not respect and fear to them, respect and fear to God, because nowhere, no matter where you work, you are working for God. Just as you would cry, obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but also as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart, serve wholeheartedly. Serve wholeheartedly. I'm going to say that again. He says here, serve wholeheartedly. How many of you know people that work half-heartedly? Half-heartedly. You ask them to do the dishes, they do the worst job. You tell them to sweep the floor, it's still dirty afterwards. Do you know what the problem is with people who work half-heartedly? They will leave their job and they'll go to the next job and do it half-heartedly. And then they'll do that the rest of their life. Those people never discover their destiny in life. Notice what God says. As if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they're a slave or free. God is our rewarder in life. God knows your heart. God sees how you do things. You need to be proven that you can handle what you are trusted with now. God needs to know that you will be able to, to handle what he wants to give you down the road. He does it by looking at what you're doing with what you have now. Then and only then does God open your destiny to you. Do you know what that means? That means stop taking the pencils and paper from your job. You know, when we worked in Russia... I went to this guy's home. He worked at the gov one government job. His garage was full of stuff he had stolen from his job. I couldn't believe it. He said, well, you know, in Russia, we own, it's, it's, everybody owns everything. I said, no, you're stealing, buddy. That's what that, that's what that means. Here's what our thoughts should be. How can I help my employer profit more? That's the kind of person God's working for. But our hearts are wrong. Our thought is often... Well, that owner has plenty of money. I can do this. I can slide by. No, no, no. Besides, he owes me. No, he doesn't. God is testing you. See, these are the thoughts that show that we fail the test. And this is the number one reason why God does not reveal our destinies to us. Answer to number 14. We should work so hard and make our business proper, prosper so much and our departments of government do so well that the people above you won't even be able to conceive of letting you go. Those are the people that God shows his destiny to. You know, here's what happened with David. Even though David never saw a life without sheep, God saw his heart, saw his loyalty, and the way he fought for those sheep, his faithfulness, his trustworthiness. God has already created you with a purpose. You don't have to work to earn an assignment. I'm going to say that again. You don't have to work to earn an assignment. You already have an assignment. You were created with one. But you don't know about it yet. And even though you don't think that that little job you're working at doesn't mean anything, your faithfulness in that job is the very thing that God is looking at, and he will promote you at the right time. In my own life, God showed me my destiny when I was 16, but it took 10 years for me to qualify to enter my destiny. It took David over 20 years to be crowned king from the time he was anointed. It took Joseph 20 years to qualify for his destiny. You know, it doesn't take 20 years, but it took Joseph 20 years. Some people never qualify for their destiny because they never deal with their character. So it's time to grow your character, to be able to stand at your destiny that God has destined you for. So important now. God is looking to put people in high positions in government, in business, in life, in education. He wants to put his children there, but most of his children don't qualify. Will you let... God, show you where you belong. Are you going to be that puzzle piece that's always boasting about how better it is than anyone else? Here's my, my challenge to you today. Let God, who actually made you, show you where you fit. You have a unique mission. You have a unique task, and you have a grace to live in it. In fact, you will love God's destiny for you so much that you would be willing to give your life for it. And God wants to show it to you as much as you want to know it. But it all depends on our heart. Are you shrewd with God's things as much as you're shrewd for your things? So here's my one last challenge. One thing to do. 
be trustworthy of the trust God has placed in your hands today. Let me pray for you. Father God, right now, I pray for everyone listening to me. I pray for everyone looking at me on Facebook or, or YouTube right now. God, I know we have looked at so many wrong things. Father, we've, we thought that you were not listening to us. Father, we thought that you did not know where we were in life. We felt like we were abandoned when all along you were waiting for us to pass the test of trustworthiness and character. Oh, Spirit of God, show each person here where we don't measure up. Turn our hearts back to you, oh God. Let us run that race that you gave us, Lord God. Let us get on the right track, oh God. Let our lives never be the same. Let us not just live mundane lives, oh God. Let us burn bright and shine for you in a dark world in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> hey, next week I'm going to be nicer, I promise. Uh, let me pray a blessing over you. Father, I bless those that heard my message. I bless their family. I bless their finances. I bless their health. We command the coronavirus to die within their households or their places of employment. Lord, I ask that you begin speaking to every person this week through your voice. Lord, even in dreams at night, Lord, show them the destiny that they could have if they would just be trustworthy where they are now. Bless them, oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We love you so much. Two things. The ice cream truck is coming. It cometh, right? It's a coming. And if you guys don't like ice cream, you can go. Please do not hit the camera on the way out. Please. Don't forget, next Sunday and the week after, we're going to be in your living room online, and then we're going to be together. Bye.